Children, you're dismissed to go out that door and around. Who are they following? All right. <laughs> if we have any parents here this morning who were not able to see the setup last week, you're welcome to go out and check, uh, check out the, the setup for the children in the back. Uh, who, everybody got a handout. Hey, Jason, turn the lights up for me, buddy. I'm known for dull, monotonous sermons, and I don't want anybody to fall asleep. Is, did I just lie? I lied in church. Good thing there's a bishop there I can go confess to. That's right. Please open your hand out. The sermon title this morning is, Salvation Belongs to the Lamb. If you have a Bible, you're free to uh, go ahead and open up to the book of Revelation. For those that, that do not know, and I think this is, I mean, I understand, you know, I understand why maybe some don't, um, some churches don't, but there are some churches that will not read from the Revelation in the lectionary let alone preach from it on Sundays. Many Orthodox churches are that way. In contrast, we have many churches in America that have giant wall charts explaining how the book of Revelation is going to be fulfilled. And I took the liberty of uh, introducing some folks in the church a few weeks ago to a genre of film that I have dubbed Christian horror. I say, what is that? How many of you ever saw A Thief in the Night from 1972? How about the success, the, the movie after it? A Distant Thunder. And I don't want to spoil it, but when Patty's under the guillotine, I mean, that's Christian horror at its, at its apex. If you've never seen it, they're all on Amazon Prime, and you have homework this afternoon after you visited with your mothers. So we have these contrasting poles with the Revelation. And largely, it's because people fail to understand it that they ignore it, or they go into an over-literal reading of it. I don't believe that there is a dragon that will rise from the sea literally. That's a shock to some people. I don't think that there's going to be literal locusts that look as they are described in the Revelation that come out of a bottomless pit somewhere in the Middle East that sting people. Wait, that one's not literal? I don't believe there's a woman who stands in the sky radiating heavenly beauty that gets wings like an eagle and flies around and chased by a dragon. Wait, that was not literal? The whole book of Revelation is apocalyptic. Apocalyptic doesn't mean confusing. Apocalyptic doesn't mean the end of the world. Apocalyptic, apocalyptic means revealed, explained. So all of the pictures in the Revelation are meant to explain things so you don't misunderstand, not so you get confused. And you have a pretty good chance here that if you can say, I don't understand how any of it works, go to any passage in the Revelation and find one of the visions and begin to work through it. And if you can nail down about 90% of what that vision means, you've nailed down 90% of the whole book because it's visions on repeat. Different visions telling the same story. It's worth it, Emily. It's totally worth it. I could go into an outline if you'd like. I mean, chapter one is the introduction. <laughs> Chapters two and three is Jesus addressing the churches. Chapters four through Goes past seven. Ten. Chapters four through ten is a series of judgments. You get into chapters ten, there's an intermission in the book. The story changes. John goes from seeing these, these uh, seals and trumpets, and now he's going to get a recommission to continue to, to prophesy because of the angel standing upon the land and the sea. We come into chapter 11, and there's two witnesses. 12, 13, and 14 is one story about a woman, a dragon, and a baby, and the kids involved in the process. Chapter 13, right between 12 and 13, is that infamous Antichrist even though the term is not used, we just get two pictures of two different kinds of beasts. 
You see, it all is apocalyptic. It's all explaining and making sense of things in a world that's confused. Maybe that should be our Bible study in Sunday school. That would take 10 years, but maybe we should do it. (laughs) We have to start sometime, that's right. So, salvation belongs to the Lamb. If you want a, a phrase that explains a large portion of the book of Revelation's message, it's that right there. Salvation belongs to the Lamb. And this is a key point. Point one of salvation belonging to the Lamb is what we see here in this chapter. Standing before the Lamb. The points this morning are geared around our reaction to the Lamb to whom salvation belongs, or if we're going to say it in older English, belongeth. Now, there's just some, some phrases that kind of... Right, Nick? Right. Standing before the Lamb. Notice what John says, after this I looked. After what? Well, I'll come back to that. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no man could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's what is on the chasuble here, is this picture from the Revelation, the Lamb with the seven seals in the book. And this is what the Lamb does in the Revelation, is He breaks the seals so you can read the scroll. And by the time we come into chapter 7, John is beholding now, not just himself before the throne of God and the Lamb of God, but there's a multitude that can't be counted from every strata and place of the plan- on, on the planet that's standing before God. Whenever you feel small and isolated, as if you're in this Christian life by yourself, you are not. Not only are you enmeshed and integrated into a global communion of the church, that communion herself is part of this cosmic reality that's ever present before the throne of God, standing before the Lamb. John again is referring back to something I just alluded to in chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back. That means there's a lot to say. In the ancient world, you would write, because of the way they made scrolls, the grains of the papyrus would go one way on one side of the document, and they would go the other way on the other side. And so you would write on the interior and then roll it up. It was only when you had a lot to say you would write on the back. So God's got a lot to reveal in His scroll of Revelation explaining His Word as it were. And the only one who has the capacity to explain it is Jesus. No one is found worthy in heaven. No one is found worthy on the earth. And no one is found worthy in the underworld. No one can open the scroll and reveal the Word of God. Only the Lamb of God. Notice, though, what John sees. Between the throne and the four living creatures, among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, literally slaughtered, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So John is seeing the Lamb of God with all power, that's the image of the horns, all knowledge, that's the image of the eyes, but the way that he demonstrates his omniscience and his omnipotence, the way that he demonstrates that he has all power and he has all knowledge is not through the exercise of might, but through sacrifice. Therein is the abode of the Holy Spirit and the antithesis of the diabolic that seeks mastery, but itself has been mastered by a lamb who bore in his body the wounds that have brought redemption to the cosmos. Standing before the lamb. Let me ask you today, where are you right now as you sit in your seat? Are you standing before the lamb? verse 8 of chapter 5 in your notes. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. 
each holding a harp. Not harp, not, not medieval. I can't even try to imitate the sound. But you know what I'm talking about. Har- do, I'm not even going to try, Matt. But you can pretend. Yeah. Not that kind of harp. More like harp. Something closer to a guitar. When Father Dean comes up and he prophesies on his, whatever that instrument's called, that has got a few strings, and if he's giving you a word, what's he do, Dave? He comes over and he usually hits you in the head with it. Or, or he taps you on the shoulder, right? Anybody's been there and seen that, you know. Suddenly, this man who was si- just standing there has began to leap and dance and twirl, and he's hitting you with his instruments that he's prophesying. Doesn't he? Yes, he does. It's always great. He'll be up here later this year, by the way. That kind of harp. Not something you can't move. Each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The thurible, when it's active, we have, when we have three acolytes, it's going to be happening. Three acolytes regularly, right? That's part of the imagery. It's the incense rising is the prayer of the saints. I don't believe a lot of Christians understand that the Lord wants them to pray because He wants to hear from them. It's as I've shared before, and it's been said for a long time now, so I'm sure you've heard it other places. Is God mostly mad, glad, or sad? And whatever you think and however you answer that question determines how you pray and whether you perceive your prayers to be a burden to the Lord or to be incense. And if you know you're standing before a slain lamb, you are more inclined to offer incense and not complaint. Because you see that there's nothing left for him to give you. And he gave because he loves. As John says in his gospel, he loved his disciples to the end. That's you and me, even though we weren't in that room. This produces something in us. This is point two, singing to the Lamb. They're standing before the Lamb. They fall down. There's prayer. Now there's a song that rises. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. What's going on here? What's happening? And I want to refer back to the first verse where, uh, that we have for the notes where he says, I, after this I heard. There's a, a, a pattern in the book of Revelation. I need you guys to come here. This is going to be good. Okay, I need you to stand right here. I need you to stand right here. All right. Now here's John. Here's what it's like when John's in heaven, okay? You, you follow along? He's... he's, he's He's, he's looking at something else, and he hears the lion of the tribe of Judah. Go ahead, get real menace, menacing looking, like look a lot like a lion. I know you had to shave, but go ahead. <laughs> that's, not, that's not tough, buddy. Come on. A lion. Come on. There we go. There we go. So he hears the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he turns to see a slain lamb. That is, that's great. You can get up now. Come on, Jacqueline's going to be, she's going to have to wash that. That's good. Thank you, guys. Very good. That theme is all through the revelation. He hears one thing, and when he turns to see what he's heard, he sees something else. So he hears the lion of the tribe of Judah, and when he turns to see this magnificent royal beast, he sees a slaughtered lamb. Because it's one thing with two aspects. That theme is all through the Revelation. In chapter 7, he hears 
144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. So he turns to see the elect of Israel saved, and he doesn't see that. He sees a multitude from all over the world that no one can count. You see, you have to discern in community because God will speak something into your soul that grips you powerfully and you'll try to walk that thing out and ultimately walk into ruin because you didn't understand what you heard is not what you will see. Because what you need to see is the the complement of what you heard because both go together. What what does it produce in us if we walk that out in a healthy way but singing? Singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Is your spirit downcast when you walk around your office place? Sing louder. John says that he saw these clothed in white robes, these multitude before him, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And heaven goes on to shout, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You need to break spiritual darkness that's on you, you got to sing. You're in despair, you got to sing. And let me tell you what some of the good stuff to sing. Dig up dig an old hymn out. Dig out a chant from Anselm in 375. Dig out something that pulls you from here. So it goes beyond the repetition but starts to pull from the depths. I know there was a, this uh, one time I was staying at a church where I was uh, working at, um, and they felt a particular sense of, of darkness one night. Matter of fact, there was all kinds of very, very unusual, or extraordinary is the word Luke uses in the book of Acts. Extraordinary uh, power encounters I kept having while I was spending a few months working in this particular church. Um, I wasn't as a pastor. I was just there helping out with things. And um, one, one night... The, the, the sense got so oppressive and I had already been praying like I had been praying before it started. You see, some people do that. They'll pray, they'll start to sense of an oppressive force and you know what they do? They stop. Like that's, that, you got it backwards. Well, as I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm, it's nothing's happening, Nick. And I'm thinking, no, wait a second. This isn't how it's supposed to go. And so then finally, with this heavy sense of darkness in this spir- moment of spiritual warfare, I pulled out some of the old camp meeting songs we used to sing. And I didn't sing them loudly because it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. But I started to sing, There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And the devil's afraid of the blood of Jesus. He's afraid of Jesus. A lot of you folks that, are, that, that get, get caught up in spiritual warfare, I want you to understand this. They are afraid of Him. And so instead of trying to like pretend the problem you're dealing with isn't really happening or to coax yourself to get rid of it somehow, just start to worship the Lord. Because the moment he decides, he, he doesn't even have to manifest his glory in a Red Sea splitting kind of event. Did you notice that in the Gospels, the slain lamb demonstrates his power simply by being present? And his presence both provokes and then expels them. Stop fearing the thing Jesus beat by dying. When you're standing before the Lamb, you will start to sing to the Lamb. And for those of you who are wondering with the way the story went, I didn't get through a couple stanzas of the song, and my voice never got loud, but the power and presence of the Holy Spirit came in in such a tangible way that I fell asleep within just a few minutes because the peace of God transfigured the atmosphere. Thirdly, 
This next one is an Easter message, so I need you to bear with me in it, okay? It's going to take a second. I may ne- even need an ex- another, but you guys just keep that water handy because you might have to do some burpees or something. <laughs> okay, here we go. I, matter of fact, I heard about a priest who wouldn't give absolution, or part of the absolution was they had to do so many burpees. Yeah, people were coming in, and they, you know what burpees is? Like, it's, it's a, it's a you, you guys want to demonstrate? No, not in that, not in that. It's, it's a full up and down jumping jack. I'm not going to do it in this either. Adam could do like 35, and Noemi could do like a ton right now. They're in the army. <laughs> but anyway, the priest, people were coming in to confess, and he realized that part of the problem is they weren't getting enough physical movement. So they were getting locked in their, the negative thinking of the mind. So he'd say, you need to do 20 burpees. What? Well, it worked. People kept seeing he had lines. It just wouldn't. Like, maybe we got to put that in. I don't know. Anyway, so, so keep with me for a second here with this third point. Sharing in the lamb. Sharing in the lamb. So this hearing and seeing happens in chapter 1 because John hears the tr- voice of a trumpet, and when he turns to see the one whose voice is like a trumpet, he sees Jesus dressed as a high priest standing in the midst of the golden lampstands and the lampstands of the churches. And because there's seven, it's the whole church that he is standing in the midst of as the high priest. And his voice, John tells us, has the sound of many waters. You ever been in Niagara Falls? You ever been somewhere where there's a giant cascading sound? This is the voice of the Lord. Recommend that you go back to Psalm 29, I believe, about the voice of the Lord. It's a Pentecost psalm. Something magnificent starts to happen, though, with this particular revelation. In chapter 14, John says this, I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion bestood the Lamb, and with him 144,000. This is referring back to the number that he heard in chapter 7, but then he saw the multitude. Remember this? Who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Everybody likes to talk about the mark of the beast on the forehead. The mark of the beast is not the point of the book of Revelation, but the seal and the mark of God is the point. And God marks his people first in chapter 7 before any plague falls upon the earth that his people might be protected and preserved. And it's this mark on the forehead that's shaped like a Hebrew letter that looks like a cross that starts the sign of the cross in the church. That's why the priest, when you're baptized, anoints your head with oil and says you are marked and sealed with the Holy Spirit as God's very own forever. Who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like an apology. No, the roar of many waters and the sound of loud thunder. What is this that he's hearing from heaven? This is the Mount Zion in heaven that Hebrews 12 alludes to when it says that we haven't come to a mountain that can't be touched, that shakes and is wrapped in darkness. No, we've come to the city of the living God where the angels are dressed in festal clothing and the saints and the righteous and the perfect are gathered there extolling the Lamb of God. That's where we go. And he says, I saw them standing on Mount Zion, and I heard the sound of thunderous of thunder and waters and waters and waters crescendoing. And he goes on and describes this worship set for them and describes how they've not engaged in idolatry. That's what the reference is about them not defiling themselves because in chapter 17 is another picture of a false church that is corrupt as it entertains the powers of the age. But it's this right here, this voice, this sound of many waters. Who is this that has the sound of many waters here? Not the lamb. It's all those that are standing with him. Did you catch this? You see, they were standing before the Lamb. They were singing before the Lamb. And now as they're with Him, singing, who who do they sound like? 
They sound like Jesus. And God has worked in them such a transfiguring grace that they're not speaking of their own accord anymore. They're not playing a note that's out of, out of harmony, that's a different song from the rest of heaven. That's one giant body that's in heaven rejoicing and glorifying in the work that the Lamb of God has done by being slaughtered. But it gets better. It gets better. Because you may be thinking, well, yeah, I know when I get, get to heaven, I'm going to be more like Jesus. Chapter 19. This is when he returns. This is when he splits the sky and he comes back at that last battle. Which again in itself was referring to many other things. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deed of the saints. You asked the question in Sunday school, when did some of the ceremony develop? When the Romans raided a church worship service in about 302 AD, they confiscated several dozen white robes that were being worn by the church. They confiscated gold and silver chalices and bowls and candlesticks. They stole the shoes, white shoes that were worn after baptism. When did the church start wearing white? Why did she stop? And what we see right here is God working in us so that we will sound like Jesus. Doesn't matter how lousy your week's been, my friend. You hear this? It doesn't matter what's been going on. It doesn't matter how difficult, what kind of struggles you've had. If you are abiding in the life of God, the Holy Spirit's transfiguring inside of you what Jesus wrought once for all upon the cross because you're a member of the body of Christ. Salvation belongs to the Lamb, and the Lamb is working in us that transfiguring glory that will not settle for anything less than sounding like that good shepherd who says, follow me. Stand with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus.